is their pricing. All right, so this is the map of the grounds. All sorts of different stuff to see. Make sure you check down every single path. Because you might miss the stuff over here. Just got the alligators. Hey everybody, Tommy for Tom's Road Trip and I'm down in Davie, Florida. This is right near Fort Lauderdale. And uh, today I'm visiting Flamingo Gardens. You can see I got my hat from the gift shop right at the beginning. This is a really nice property. I was looking it up online several weeks before planning this trip. So with the name Flamingo in it, you knew I was going to come see this place because they actually do have flamingos. It's not just a name. Very nicely lush gardens, lots of different types of plant life, and they do have a bunch of animals. There's a tram tour, so lots to see and do. I'm happy to be here. It's supposed to be roughly a. Um, it's supposed to be a nice day. Cold weather is coming tomorrow, so. I, I do have my jacket in my backpack just in case it gets a little chilly later, but right now it's it's very nice. So let's get started. Check this place out. So this showed you the signage about the the botanical collection. Very lush tropical. You've got birds scattered throughout. You got a kill build toucan. Wow, this is a pretty bird. Hi bird. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. Look at that. All the different colors. Got red, yellow, orange, some white. Wow, you're a gorgeous bird, huh? Yeah, you know you are. And he has appropriately named Tiki. From the Tiki 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 room at Disney. Hi, Tiki. This is nice. Just some nice flowers. Very lush. Got a couple ibis. This is a massive tree. Got the new garden. Some of them are starting to flower. Spring will be here before you know it. Got blue and gold macaw. Having some breakfast. Hello. These two are actually named Batman and Robin. These are called red cluster figs. Going all over the tree. Got several different types of birds here. You got a citron cockatoo, eclectus parrot, sun conure, and Quaker parrot. And a Quaker parrot was following me around. Some very beautiful sun conures in the back. Very, very colorful birds. And of course, we got the citron cockatoo. Hi, pretty bird. Like with the pretty orange feathers in the top. And the eclectus parrot right on the top. Hi, pretty birdie. All right, trying to focus on the bird, not the bars. Now the birds have heat lamps to stay warm. 
Hey birdies! Hi birdies, hi! Hello pretty birds! We got some other types of birds. We got a severe macaw, umbrella cockatoo, more blue and gold macaw, and a hyacinth macaw. Hey birdies! Got these all over the place. Got a tropical hazelnut or Indian almond or poon tree. That's a pretty good sized tree. I do you like hazelnuts? And there's this massive remnant of a tree. Not sure what exactly happened to it, but then you got another tree growing out the top of it. This is a champion tree. Look how it kind of uh, clumps together and grows. I like these very colorful type of plants. The Panama canoe tree. Big fat trunk. And you see ignorant people have scratched their initials or name on the trunk. That actually damages the tree. So do not do that when you come to places. Apparently it does not have any leaves because it is still winter. There's also signage here, graffiti is vandalism. Leave any mark on our plants will get you ejected from the gardens without refund as should be. But you see how it harms the trunk of the tree and it's extremely ignorant to do this. These are different varieties of croton. It's a very popular plant to have around the state of Florida. But as you can see they grow really really large if they're not pruned back. These are also crotons. They're just different varieties. As well as this. Of course, bamboo. See how large these things get. Look at this tree here. This thing's growing on it. So South Florida is a subtropical climate. Things will grow down here that they won't in other parts of the state. It's a different palm tree. Got some grasshoppers. Got some nice benches to relax by the waterfall. This is a dead end path. This is really nice. They have Various varieties of palm trees here also. Got some more birds. You got military macaw, ruby macaw, and the Major Mitchell's cockatoo. Ooh, that's a pretty cockatoo. Love the coloration. And of course you got the macaws. Military macaw walking around. Hello! Oh, coming up to say hello. Climbing up to say hi. Hi! <laughs> Gotta be in the shot also. <laughs> There's the ruby macaw. Also very pretty. Love the coloration. Plenty of signage to let you know which way to go. So for the time being, I'm gonna head to the left, because that's where the majority of stuff is. And I'll do a wildlife encounter later, which is to the right. Oh yeah, I've got some elephant ears. Till they got their name because they are similarly shaped to an ear of an elephant. So following that path, you got the restroom locations. And a very beautiful peacock or peafowl. Which you notice is the male because it's got the pretty feathers. 
Just strutting along. Got some more ibis. And these are wild birds. They are known all throughout the state of Florida. Mostly to the uh, the southern half. This is really nice. Mr. Birdie's getting a drink of water. Wow, this is nice. So I think in this pond you might notice is the koi. Basically giant goldfish. This place is just fantastic. All the trees and plant life. Another huge tree. There you go, Flamingo Gardens, Davie, Florida. They do have a butterfly garden, however, it is not butterfly season. Springtime is probably the best time to come to a place like this. If you're looking to see uh, butterflies and lots of different flowers. Got the Flamingo Pond snack bar. This is their menu board. Got a very nice peacock here. Oh, here we go. Flamingo Pond. Go American Flamingo. Oh, yeah. Do you love the flamingos? Got a couple nice ducks in here also. You gonna get your close up? Yeah? Ducks come over. Get my good side. Hi. Who thinks I got food for him? No food, I'm sorry. But yeah, flamingos. Lots of ibis here also. Got hummingbird garden. Again, more than likely, uh, springtime is gonna be the better time to be here. This is right by the food area. And they do have a food truck. This is their menu board. All right, got Florida Panther. This is the Florida Panther habitat. You see the Florida Panther's habitat. And I can see a panther. There we go. You see, he's not pink, so he's not a pink panther. The younger people that are watching this probably have no idea what pink panther is. You'll have to look it up. Beautiful animal. These are the female peafowl or peacock. You see, they don't have the really bright tail feathers because the males come to them. So they have all the power. Just like with humans. And we've got the Birds of Prey Center. We've got a Mississippi kite. This is going to be this bird right here. And we've got a shallow tailed kite. Is the other one. Everglades Wildlife Sanctuary. Got some fish crow. Sort of fish crow getting a drink of water and a bath. Now crows are very intelligent. They're able to uh, 
learn words. They just heard one of them say hello. Hello! Hello! Hi, bird. How are you? Crows and ravens are some of the most intelligent types of birds. They will actually learn different tasks. And they can actually use, uh, use tools. I don't mean like to build a house or anything, but they'll be able to, to use like a stick to get out of a bit of food that's in a uh, in a hole. Pretty bird, huh? Got a cluster fig tree. It's this massive tree. We saw a what was left of a cluster fig. I don't know if it got blown over during one of the hurricanes or struck by lightning or for whatever reason. The top portion of the tree was missing. But this is a massive tree. Got backyard birds. All of the animals that are housed here at Flamingo Gardens are here because they cannot live in the wild. They came here for various reasons. This place gives them a permanent home. Let's close up view of the female peafowl. Hello. I'm nice and close. Got the hawk walk. Got Harris's hawk. Flew right up. Make sure I got a good view of them. There's the other one in the back. Very, very nice. Got a red shouldered hawk. Oh, yeah. There's the other one right here. Yeah, definitely got red shoulders. Next up, we got Owl Alley. Got Barn Owl. The Barn Owl was, I believe, used in the in the animal presentation, so it's not in its habitat. Got a great horned owl. That is a fantastic bird. That's definitely a big owl. This is a barred owl. So he's facing the opposite direction. For sure he's napping. Also a beautiful bird. An eastern screech owl. Oh, that's a cool bird. It looks a little blurry. Uh, it looks a little blurry because it's looking through the mesh. Got a burrowing owl. Here's the burrowing owl. Very cool. There we go. So he just turned his head. Got falcon fairway. Got a broad winged hawk. There's one of them, or several in this actual habitat here. There's another one. And a third one further back. Got a Cooper's Hawk. There we go. Got a Crested Cara Cara. Oh, that is a very pretty bird. 
like the orange and yellow around its beak and around its eyes. And a second one, possibly on an egg. Got a red tailed hawk. And he actually ran over when I came up with my camera. Some like my camera, others shy away from it. Got some black vultures. Black and vultures. turkey vultures. Several of them in here. That's cool. Got a lighter colored vulture in there. Got Eagle Expressway. That bald eagle. Additional information about bald eagles. And the bald eagles have a very nice size habitat. Here we go. So the ones in the back. You know, it's on the ground over here. There we go. There we go. There is the bald eagle. We got golden eagle. These guys got a very nice looking habitat. There is the golden eagle. Really, really cool. All right, got a coastal prairie. The aviary that I'm in right now. All different types of birds. I see white pelican, brown pelican, wood stork, other ibis. Also birds up on the tree. See one of the birds on a nest. Oh, I see a spoonbill. There we go. Where is that spoonbill? Yeah, mangrove swamps. And that's exactly what this is. Of course, a smaller version. Cute little bird. But yeah, this is be what it would be like brackish water basically. A couple other birds up in nests. The additional cypress swamp. Hey birds. Hardwood hammock. That's exactly what this would be. A sawgrass marsh. I got some young pelicans in there also. More ibis. Lots and lots of ibis. Brown pelicans and the bigger white pelicans. Got some other water birds. Hi. How you doing? Don't try to bite me. Hi. Now these birds right here, I actually forget their name, but they will be in the water with just their heads out and then in order to dry their feathers, they'll stand with their wings 
spread it far apart because you don't have the oils that a lot of birds have so they have to literally wait for their wings to dry which is a, either a raven or a crow I actually forget how to tell the difference they have different shaped beaks and their heads are a little bit different they even got seagulls in here seagulls <laughs> in the back. Like, get away. Get away from me. It's a better view of the spoonbill. Along the beaches, uh, Clearwater Beach is a very popular beach in the Tampa Bay area and they have a lot of fishing piers and you're gonna see these guys all over the place all over now they just noticed someone on a golf cart and that usually signifies food so all the birds they're going to start walking towards the front here in anticipation of getting some food. They're all running and flying over. Yep, she's here with food. And all the birds know it. All the birds know she's here with the food. See? Get some of them just can't wait. Look at that. Dinner time for the birds. <laughs> a couple don't want to wait. Yeah, some of them just don't want to wait at all. One bird on here has got the right idea. Let's eat what it want. <laughs> so they are going to follow her all around. Got a lovely rooster. What's up, man? How you doing? Look at my tray here. You see these beautiful orchids. They're actually working on covering up all these orchids as it's supposed to be quite cold for this area tomorrow but they have lots of different varieties of orchid We've got American black bear we're showing you the bear habitat I do see the bear it's right here I apologize for the light reflection. But yeah, that's the bear. Yeah, bear, bear. There you can see more of the black bear. All right, we got the North American river otter. This is our habitat. Got quite a few in here. God, they are so cute. And of course, you got lots of water. Oh, back into the water. Back into the water. Get a slide and everything. This is really nice setup for him. Just having a good time. There we go. 
Back down. <laughs> so you sometimes get an underwater view if they're in this area. But yeah, they were having a good time. Got the rookery. Because the rookery is going to have all different types of birds. Mostly ibis right now. Yeah, it's pretty much all I, all I see. All right, we got African spurred tortoise. It's a good size. A little bit bigger than Sheldon that I got at home. I also got box turtles. Of course, I don't believe the box turtles are out. So we got them inside because of the cold weather coming up tomorrow. More than likely, a lot of the animals will be brought inside. Got freshwater turtles. See, three of them right here. And then a little pond. Got alligator snapping turtle. This is this guy's little pond. And here he is. Right there. That's a good size. Got American alligator. Hi alligators. I saw lots of alligators. Yesterday when I visited the Everglades. And there's one of those green iguanas that are all over the place in South Florida. That. There's actually a falling iguana advisory for tomorrow. That means these guys live up in the trees and the weather gets too cold, they can't handle it. Then you kind of get stiff and then you fall from the tree. The alligator is much more exciting to look at. Huh. All those teethies right there. And across the way, you got the juvenile alligators. Got Florida Bobcat. And it's looking all over for Bob. And I see him up in his box. Or her box. Because it's called a bobcat doesn't mean the name's Bob. There we go. Nice fuzzy kitty. Oh. That's a nice fuzzy kitty right there. Back at the flamingo pond. What's up everybody? Another one of those iguanas I was telling you about. Let me show you the size of this tree. It's even larger than the other one that I showed you. I have been looking for this bird all day long. The very beautiful white peacock. Now this is not albino, because it have red eyes. Just lacks the pigmentation. Now this is a male. I've seen them in other places with their tail feathers open. It's just as beautiful to see. Hi. Thank you, have a good day. Thanks for showing yourself. You know, check out. The Everglades Amphitheater Animal Encounter. A very loving and fulfilling life, nonetheless. Now, some of our animal friends will be a little less shy than others, and they get to become ambassador species, like the ones you're about to meet, which means that they don't mind getting up close and personal with you guys for educational purposes, and it gives you more of an up close look at some South Florida wildlife. Well, as we bring out our animal friends and we tell you a little bit about them and their stories, I want you guys to keep in mind that these guys are still wild animals at heart and they do have some instincts to them. So we want to make sure that they stay nice and relaxed throughout the show um, so that we can have a really nice show for everybody.
everybody. Um, as we bring out our animals, I just want to ask that you guys are going to be remaining seated, that we're keeping our voices to a minimum. If we have any questions, we like to kind of save them for the end. Um, and there might be some opportunities to do some animal interactions as well at the end. Um, but, you know, if we get a little too close for comfort, um, just give us a funny face and we'll be happy to back off of anything. Now, before we also get started, I'd like to draw your attention to this beautiful box right over here. You might have noticed it on the way in. This box is super important to us here at Flamingo Gardens and especially our animal care staff team because anything that goes directly into that box is going to go directly back to our animals that you're about to meet. So that helps you with enrichment projects, with feeding them, medical bills, a lot of good stuff to help our animals, you know, make sure they stay nice, happy, and healthy. And so if you like the work that we do, you like the animals you're about to meet, and you wish to donate, that would be a great place to start. But also on the screen, you're going to notice that there is a list that keeps flashing through our PowerPoint. And that's for a lot of locals here that are ever looking to get rid of bed sheets, gardening tools, toddler toys, and stuff like that. We're always happy to take donations like that as well because our animals will definitely put them to good use. Are you guys ready to meet some of our animal guests? Yeah. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Hey. 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 Hey.
Um, we try to keep it a little interesting. We don't feed anything live here, but we do try to do some enrichment by maybe hiding the food in their enclosure, or maybe wiggling it around to make it look alive. Um, but what's really cool about somebody like Wanza here, her favorite thing to eat in the wild would be other snakes, and that's why they get their name, King of All Snakes. Um, it's really important to have king snakes in the wild because they're going to help us with population control of not only the non-venomous, but also venomous snakes as well. So it's really cool that she's able to ingest a venomous snake, but not by being venomous herself. Instead, these two types of snakes, because they are not venomous, they are called constrictor snakes, which means when they are hunting, they're going to find a prey that they like. They're going to, you know, more so lunge and strike around the neck and jugular area. And then they use the rest of their body to really coil themselves around that food and they literally will start squeezing the life out of that prey it's kind of like one big hug until that prey is fully deceased and once it is fully deceased they start to kind of relax and then they're going to enjoy their meal and keep in mind these guys do not need to eat every single day being a cold-blooded reptile they do need time in between meals in order to digest their food so it could take a couple of days maybe even longer than a week or two before they're lucky to catch another prey and have time to digest in between did you have anything you wanted to add for these guys? Um, not much, uh, except these, uh, you can see it on, on her face. Uh, it's really interesting to see she's got about 10 little holes on her face. Now those are not actually nostrils, those are heat sensing pits for infrared. Uh, now these guys, all snakes can see in infrared. And actually, when we were talking about how they strike their prey in the jugular, how do they even know where that is? Because of this heat sensing uh, ability that they have, they can see the circulatory system of their prey. Uh, so they are able to find the jugular or any major arteries latch onto that. So that is another sense that they use, which is really, really cool to help them to find their prey. Yes, now we might have some people in the crowd who are fearful of snakes, right? Not everyone's gonna be a fan of these guys, and that's totally okay. If you're scared of snakes, I want you to remember this. They're not gonna hear you if you scream. They're not gonna know that you're terrified. So one thing to do if you are scared of a snake and you wish to communicate that you do not want that snake anywhere near you, if you're walking on a trail in your backyard, somewhere where you might be encountering any kind of snakes, the best thing for you to do is to always be walking with heavy feet and to be shuffling around. Because when you're doing that, you're actually going to be sending vibrations through the ground that the snake is going to be picking up on long before you get a chance to see that snake. That snake is able to determine that there is a lot larger of a predator approaching and that snake is either going to want to leave before you ever see it or maybe find somewhere nice to hide and maybe camouflage and stay hidden until the coast is clear. These guys are always going to be more scared of you than you are of them, believe it or not, because you are the larger predator. Um, they will not want to try to hunt you out or, you know, try to, you know, find you to try to eat you because they realize that you are not something that they can actually consume. Now, if you're somebody who is a snake enthusiast and you're thinking about getting a pet snake, as we mentioned, somebody like Medusa, these ball pythons are very, very popular in the pet trade and you can get all different kinds of morphs and colorations and stuff. It's really cool. But we really encourage that you guys are doing your research before you take in any kind of new pet, especially our reptilian friends. A pet snake like this can last anywhere from 15 to 20 years in proper care and captivity. So that's a very, very long relationship you're going to have with that snake. And you want to make sure that you can give it a forever home. Um, also, depending on the species of snake, they can get very, very large. These guys do max out at about, you know, five to six feet. But if anything, somebody like a Burmese python, those were ones allowed in the pet trade here in Florida, and those guys reach over 14 feet. There are people with apartments and condos who couldn't keep their snakes for long because they couldn't really have a big enough enclosure for them. And so we started seeing them being released or escaping into the wild. And that's why we now today actually have them banned in the pet trade here in Florida. So those kind of situations can be avoided in the future as long as we're doing our research before we take it on these really, really awesome animals. But I hope you guys enjoy the snakes. We have another cool guest for you guys. You guys can come in and grab a seat if you like. All right. Oh, so our wow. next guest is a beautiful barn owl. This is sugar cane. And uh, you'll notice that his head is kind of tilted. It is a permanent thing that he's got going on here. Now, he was found by a group of scientists doing research in a sugarcane field. Yeah, he does that. That's called baiting. He's just um, readjusting his feet on the glove. Normal behavior for uh, birds on the glove to do that. Especially him, he kind of gets freaked out by, uh, by strollers. 
So, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, so he was found by a group of scientists doing research in the sugarcane field. They saw that a bunch of backyard birds, like grackles and crows, were mobbing a nest. And usually, backyard birds will mob nests of other uh, birds of prey. If they see that a predator is nesting in their area, they're going to band together and they're going to start mobbing that nest. So the scientists went over there, they saw that most of the chicks were dead except for sugarcane. But he did su sustain uh, a lot of damage to his neck and unfortunately uh, uh, didn't heal very well uh, naturally back to its uh, natural position. Uh, so he uh, does have a little uh, tilt to his head permanently. Now right here we've got Aubrey. And uh, she is an eastern screech owl. She is adorable. Now she, uh, you'll notice, is missing her left eye. That happened because she was already an adult hanging out in the trees. And um, she, some kid in their backyard was doing some target practice. And I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he maybe missed a soda can and got her instead. I don't know. But he did hit her eye. And... Um, they uh, realized, you know, they hit something, uh, went to his parents, and they scooped her up and brought her here. And unfortunately, that eye was not salvageable, it was too damaged, uh, so it did need to be removed. Now, with one eye, owls can't really do very much hunting for themselves, so she is non-releasable. She can't fend for herself back out in the wild, so she's here. Now, that was well over 20 years ago. She is an old bird, and these guys are monogamous. They will have one partner throughout their entire lives, and uh, since she was with us for most of her life, um, she uh, did not find a partner until a little bit recently. She has a beautiful gray eastern screech owl partner named Travis, but Travis is only six years old, so she's doing real well for herself. Now in captivity, these guys can live up to 30 years in the wild. It's more like 15, um, because obviously in captivity, we've got veterinarians who can help with whatever problems, and uh, less predation for these guys, or no predation for these guys in captivity. All right, so their eyes are super important because they are specially formed to help pick up more light and also more motion. Um, these guys can focus on things eight times faster than any human being, and they are more attuned to motion, so they're noticing things in the trees that we can't even begin to notice. So Sugarcane's uh, kind of a little anxious because he's seeing stuff that normally we don't even notice. So that is why their eyes are really important. And also because of that elongated shape of their eyes, they can't actually rotate their eyes in their sockets. They're fixed in place. Um, so they do have to rotate their heads 270 degrees in one direction to be able to compensate for that. They have 14 vertebrae in their necks to help them to do that. In comparison, we, he we humans have seven vertebrae in our necks. So these guys are really cool and special. Now the eye color, something really interesting. We've got these two owls out. Uh, so she has a beautiful greenish yellow eye. And that means that she's crepuscular. She's out in the morning and in the evening, hunting in that mid-level of light. She can still have the cover of darkness, but still have a little bit of help because the sun is rising, rising or setting. Um, but Sugar King here, he's got those completely dark eyes, which means he is nocturnal. He's out during the night, and these guys are amazing hunters. These are some of the best hunters in uh, the owls. Uh, they have that beautiful heart-shaped face, and all owls have a facial disc. That is to help them to uh, funnel in sound into their ears. Now, their ears are not symmetrically placed like ours are. They are actually asymmetrically placed. One ear is up by the eye, and the other is down by the beak. So they are able to hear all wavelengths of sound, and the difference in time between when, when the sound hits one ear and the other is all they need to help triangulate where their prey is. And that facial disc helps to uh, act like a satellite dish and funnel in that sound. And because of the barn owl's beautiful, perfect shape of the, of the facial disc, these guys are the most sensitive in hearing of the owls. They can hunt with 95% accuracy, completely blind. So these guys are absolutely amazing. Now their talons are not something to laugh at. These things are crazy, uh, amazing weapons that they use to grab their prey. He has a strength of over 300 pounds of pressure per square inch when he's holding down. Um, now Aubrey, 
does have a strength of 100 pounds of pressure per square inch. We humans, we can do at most 70 pounds of pressure per square inch with our grip. So these guys are incredibly strong. That's why we're wearing gloves. Even cute little Aubrey is stronger than anybody that you know. So these guys are formidable apex predators. So I'm sorry to cut you off yeah. there, but if you guys just paid attention to what Aubrey just did over here, it looked like she threw up. What she just did was cough up one of her pellets that is standing right next to me or right next to my left foot here. So if anybody would like a souvenir on the way out, this would be the place to get it. But what that is, it's kind of like, you know, when your cats lick themselves and they have too much hair and they cough up a hairball. But these guys are eating um, about six days a week. We do have one day of fasting so that they can actually clear out what's in their stomach. And they will create these little pellets from inside of all the things that they're not able to digest. So that pellet, if you were to actually dissect it, might have some bone, might have some feathers of like other little critters that we've tried feeding here throughout the week. Um, it's made up of a lot of cool stuff and that's a really cool way to, you know, kind of figure out if there's any birds in your area or any owls in your area of what they're eating. Um, if you were to kind of like sit there and dissect if anybody wants to get all scientific. But, but that's what they do. It's very normal for them and it's actually a very, very healthy um, sign that our owls are doing good and digesting and getting the nutrients that they need. Yeah. So that is so cool. I love, I love when they do it during the so show. Weird. And it's so gross, but it's really cool. We find owl pellets of wild owls in the area, and we just, we all huddle around the table and like pick it apart and we're like freaking out. So we, we love this kind of stuff. Um, does anybody have any questions about owls in general? Or Did we explain it really well? Do you have a question? What's your question? So why was the other owl very little? So there are all different kinds of owls. So very little owls like very little food. Uh, so they like to eat tiny things. And this is a medium-sized owl, and he's going to be eating medium-sized things like rats. So their size kind of uh, helps them with the kind of food that they like to eat. So if she's really small, she'll be able to go into small places and eat things. Good question. All right, so we're going to get our last guest out here. Yeah, a question here. Oh, yeah, you can do a question here? Yeah. What's your question? <laughs> owls can see at night? Yes, yeah, some owls can see at night. If their eyes are dark, they can see at night. Very good. All right, All right. thank you, Sugar Queen and Christina. And now our last guest is going to be our only marsupials native here to North America. So that means that these guys are our closest relatives to things like koalas and kangaroos and wallabies from places like Australia. Um, and it's because these guys all have that marsupium pouch. And so I am talking about our very own Virginian opossums. Today you guys get to meet Miss Sweet Pea, the Virginian opossum. Now Sweet Pea was brought into us as a tiny little thing. She was about the size of a hamster when she was first brought in and her eyes weren't even open yet. She was found abandoned and she was actually left underneath, uh, or she was found underneath an abandoned car and somebody left her outside my front door. So I brought her into work. Um, you know, when they're that small, they're very, very delicate. We don't really have you know, such high expectations because they shouldn't be away from their mothers as small as she was. But she was quite the trooper and she definitely pulled through. But we did notice that in the beginning she was having some difficulty walking. She wasn't able to use her back legs and she was kind of dragging them. So our veterinarians were able to help us determine that she had been forming what's called a metabolic bone disease. And that's because she had been weaned from her mother too early and she wasn't getting all the proper nutrients that she needed in order for her bones to grow nice and strong and to be able to support her. But we were able to substitute what she needed and we caught it at an early stage that she overcame her MBD and she is a perfectly normal little healthy opossum now. But the only other issue we ran into is we've had to be so hands-on with her from before she even opened her eyes that she became very attached and desensitized and basically she's what we would call imprinted, which means she doesn't really have a lot of natural fear of human contact because that's all she's known. Um, so she thinks of herself more as like your house cat, if anything. Um, she likes, you know, to be in her air conditioning. She loves her cuddles, her favorite snacks. She loves to be interacted with. So she makes for a great ambassador species um, here with us at Flamingo Gardens. Now, 
being a Virginian opossum, uh, a lot of people have a lot of false information about these guys. A lot of people don't like them because there's a lot of you know misleading information and people have the wrong idea about them. And that's why they're my favorite animals to talk about because I'm here to break a lot of those myths and you know change a lot of mindsets today. Now for one, a lot of people don't like these guys because they think that they carry a lot of diseases and illnesses and you know they might transmit you know some stuff to you and your household pets. And that could be further from the truth. Instead, I want you guys to see these guys as free exterminators um, and the best pest control that you can get. Because by having one Virginian opossum around, they're going to be eliminating all these other little critters that will be the ones that carry a lot of these illnesses and diseases that do transmit to you and your household pets. So for example, having one Virginian opossum around, they're going to like to eat all the cockroaches and palmetto bugs, maybe some spiders. They like to eat snakes that are non-venomous and venomous as well. They like to eat poisonous cane toads. They like to eat, um, you know, any dead animals like carrion and carcasses and stuff like that. They're able to ingest just about anything and none of that is going to harm them or they're not going to catch any diseases from eating all of these things. They have a very, very low um, body temperature, which also wouldn't allow them to really be a host to things like rabies or Lyme disease, distemper, feline AIDS, and the list would go on and on. It's very, very uncommon and I've worked with these guys for years. I've yet to ever meet that one opossum out of you know the statistics that has anything to transmit to me or any of the animals around us. It's kind of crazy. Um, so these guys are pretty much immune to just about everything. Um, so we don't need to be fearful of them. But another reason why people don't like them is they think that they're very vicious and scary and intimidating. Um, these guys are probably one of the most passive animals you'll ever meet. And that's because they really can't see what's going on around them 90% of the time. They are blind even at nighttime being a nocturnal species. They cannot see further past their nose. Their eyesight is very, very poor. So they're pretty much in fear 24-7 because they don't know what's going on around them. Just like that. Um, so if anything, uh, you know, when they do feel threatened, if they do feel that there's a predator going on or nearby, what they do is they get very, very still. They often find themselves cornered because our dogs and our cats might chase them down. I've told people, you know, for as long as I've been working with them, I would bet my life. It is never the Virginian opossum who is trying to chase your dog or your cat. It's always the other way around, and then that's when they have to get defensive. But if it were up to them, you know, once the coast is clear, if that dog or cat leaves them alone, they're going to run in the opposite direction. They're not going to sit there and try to fight because they can't see what's really going on. The only times you're ever going to get bit by a Virginian opossum is if you get close enough to a Virginian opossum to actually bite you. But being a blind animal, you have to get pretty close to actually get bit. Um, they do have very sharp canines. They have one of the largest amounts of canines in their mouths for an animal, uh, for almost like a mammal, anything. Um, so they can use them if they need to, but they really would rather not. They really just want to run away in the opposite direction. So if anything, these guys are not to really be feared of. Um, another line of self-defense for these guys is actually playing opossum, but what's happening is that they pass out from fear. When they pass out from fear, they go into a coma-like state where they will even slow down their own heart rate, and they're gonna trick a predator into thinking that they're actually deceased when they are not. They're gonna start to produce a lot of bad smells um, so that they actually smell like a dead animal, and so that predator is kind of double-guessing if he really wants to eat something that smells that bad and rotten. Um, so they remain intact and unharmed until that predator leaves them alone, and then they can go about their day like nothing ever happened. That playing opossum coma-like state can last up to six hours if necessary. It's pretty incredible. Um, but, you know, that's pretty much all they do is either stay very, very still in hopes that nothing's going to bother them and leave them alone, or they pass out from fear. That's pretty much all they're known for. Um, if anything, we're actually a big predator for them as well. You know, our cars, we see them getting hit by cars very, very often. That's because, again, at nighttime, they don't see very well when they're trying to cross the roads. They're not able to see the headlights coming in time in order to react and to get to somewhere safe. So we want to make sure that we're slowing down while we're driving at nighttime just to kind of give them a fair shot. Now, another really cool thing about them are these prehensile tails. It means, uh, a prehensile tail means that they have full mobility of this tail. It's kind of like an extra arm, because um, these guys do a lot of climbing. 
So when they're climbing at greater heights, it's very easy to get scared by something, and so they don't want to fall from a greater height and have a serious injury. So they will use this tail in order for a lot of balance and coordination. You're being such a wiggle butt today. They're going to use this tail for a lot of balance and coordination um, by wrapping it around something more stable and sturdy. Um, they do not actually like to sleep or hang upside down from their tails like we often see de depicted in like movies and cartoons. That's actually not in their nature. So their tail is not really meant to hold their body weight for that long a period of time. So if you ever see one hanging upside down, chances are something just scared the life out of them. He's trying to get back on all fours. But one last cool fact. These opossums, when they are pregnant, these moms are going to only be pregnant for about 13 days, and that's about it. But they will give birth anywhere from 15 to 20 little babies that are the size of jelly beans that then climb into the pouch and latch on for a few months as they continue to grow. And when they get to be too big, they climb out and hang on to mom's back for a piggyback ride, and they learn what it is to be an opossum. But by the end of the first year, they're considered full-grown adults and on their own. So I hope I change some of your mindsets on these guys next time you encounter them. But we hope you guys enjoy this little presentation and showcase of some of our animal ambassadors. We hope that you have a great weekend and stay safe and come back to visit very, very soon. Please don't forget about our lovely donation box on the way out. And you guys can give Sweet Pea a nice pet on the way, back, on the way out. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. See all the female peacocks up here on the roof. Getting a bird's eye view, so to speak plus a view of the Muscovy ducks. Get these types of ducks near where I live as well. What's up man, how you doing? Hi. Get your wings all spread out, you trying to dry off? What's up ducky ducks? You also have lots and lots of cats. Different cats are all throughout. A lot of the cats were basically dropped off or found their way here. Just notice this peacock has some white feathers as well, as opposed to the more colorful variety. Still has its full tail feathers though. Got the wetlands walkway. All right, by the pond, you got a couple Canadian geese. One's kind of hissing at me because I think it's going to bother them. You can see the water. What are wetlands? These are the birds of the wetlands. Sadly, these three ducks were not included on the list. This is nice, got a lovely boardwalk. You also might see some Florida mottled duck. Also, I see some more Muscovy ducks. I do like these guys, so. Very nice, though. See some pickerel weed. And we also got some fire flag. You see some of them are just starting to bloom. We got bald cypress. That's what all these are. Of course, not quite bald anymore. Starting to get the leaves growing in. Springtime's just around the corner. Here's a lot better view of the cypress knees. These are all the cypress trees. Walk on this little mini path. I see a couple of other type of duckies and a big old goose. Got any golden eggs for me? Huh? 
Can I get your business card in case I get in an accident? I need some Aflac. Can you say Aflac? He just said it, did you hear him? In South Florida, the coconut palms actually grow coconuts. It only happens in the subtropical climate of South Florida. So this whole area is all new and they are still working on it. A couple more birds over here. So saying coconut palm. There you go. You got the pods growing on the trees up in my area of Florida, but it doesn't grow fruit because it's too the climate's not warm enough. Prehistoric plants. Now this is a fantastic looking tree. See all the Spanish moss on these oak trees. All right, next up to Tropical Fern Garden. Yes, <laughs> all various different types of ferns. Nice. Yeah, some ferns like this one get pretty large. Got the fragrance garden. A little sculptures all throughout. Now again, this is going to be much, much nicer in the springtime. They have all plants that make flowers that have a really nice smell to them. Another nice peacock. Another one over there. This is really nice. There's also restroom locations right here. I love this variant of plant. All the different colorations. And they do have a gift shop, which is the entrance and the exit point. This is where I got my hat. I got several different types of hats. All right, so with that, it's gonna conclude my visit to Flamingo Gardens in Davie, Florida. I had a fantastic time here. Lots of beautiful plants and animals. Enjoyed every moment of it. I hope you guys enjoyed what I showed you. I love going to places like this, natural settings, uh, old Florida type attractions. Leave some comments down below what your favorite part of the video was, whether it be one of the plants or flowers or, or trees or one of the animals perhaps. If you guys have not already subscribed, please subscribe to my channel if you like this type of stuff. I go to zoos, aquariums, theme parks, and roadside attractions all over the country. Eventually I'll branch out from there. I love hearing from everybody. Leave some comments down below, comments, questions, suggestions, anything like that. Thank you everybody for subscribing and supporting my channel. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.